tous. Merci de vos différents messages de sympathie. The cyclist is his own gyroscope. He produces not only movement, but equilibrium. The faster he turns his legs, the more harmonious this equilibrium becomes. He's spinning. If your wheels spin round, your legs spin round. If your legs spin round, your head will too. The bike is my essential metaphor my fundamental model. As long as I'm pedalling, I'm in equilibrium. As long as I'm pedalling, I'm spinning circles. The bike is the school of the wind. There are two kinds of biking wind, objective wind and relative wind. The first one is produced by the world around us and the second is the work of the cyclist, his masterpiece, you might say. For the faster he is, the more wind he creates. The wind of the world is the one that hits you square on. Against it, there's no remedy other than friendship and solidarity. Actually, there's something of the sailor and the cyclist. He flexes the hands, elbows out. He's got a very, very distinctive style, has Chris Hoy completely focused and concentrated today. And he's just got to focus now. Chris Hoy sweeps down from the top. Kevin Serrault at the bottom. The Frenchman's gapped him at the moment, but here comes Chris Hoy. Serrault swings up. Chris Hoy, he's up to him. They're drag racing to the line. Chris Hoy, Kevin Serrault, they come round. Chris Hoy throws his bike at the line and it's a gold medal. Once again, the Chris Hoy. I've always been very attentive to my position in the bike. A good position allows you to go faster, further, longer. There's one cycling mystery that fascinates me. Some people are made to go on a bike who say they have class, in cahoots with the wind, feline and unreadable. A real bike does not squeak, rub or groan, it purrs. But if you pass a wall, you can make out the light hum of the chain on the cog. The peloton, on the other hand, makes noise. From the outside, it's a powerful and low-pitched breathing. A breathing that no mechanical noise could conceal. If it were a locomotive, it would be a high-speed TGV rather than a steam engine. From the inside, the sound comes from a hundred little noises that all add up. A hundred derailers, a hundred chains, a hundred gear changes at once. All of that locked in a mobile cocoon in which sounds pass from front to back. If you're adroit enough to maintain your position, the peloton is a protective bubble that isolates you and pulls you forward. If you listen closely, you can make out bits of chatter, laughter, quick commands. At the start of a climb, that's fun, but when you really start to gasp and fight for air, and you hear someone who's still cracking jokes, it's not as amusing. Robert Miller from Glasgow, riding on his first Tour de France, and what a day he is having. And Miller's gone! Miller's gone! This time he's having none of it from Jimenez. He's waited and look at this attack! Robert Miller of Glasgow can take the stage now. He's definitely going to take the top of the climb. Second in the Tour second in the Col de Spain. He's now the winner at the top of the Col de Pérezold. We've just a descent of some eight and a half miles to go and victory for Robert Miller. And look at the gap Robert Miller has opened. Well, we knew Robert Miller was a gifted climber. It would have been a very, very brave man indeed who would have said on one of the hardest days on the Tour de France's year, a rider from Glasgow would have been taking all the major parts in the action.
With the bike there's an animal relation with the world. The mountains you see are there to be scaled, the valleys are for cruising down into, shadows are for hiding in and stretching out. To be in the landscape, in its heat, its rain, its wind, is to see it with different eyes. The mountain rising before me isn't a mountain, it's a grade to climb, a test, a doubt, sometimes anxiety. At the summit it's a conquest, lightness, I've taken it and it's mine. This unknown amateur rider from Ayr in Scotland is now smashing the most coveted record of them all. His radical style, his homemade bicycle, the world hour record is going to fall to Graham Aubrey by the end of this lap. There's no doubt about that now. 51.596 kilometres, Francesco Moser's record of eight years ago has gone to a rider on a homemade bicycle. There are a lot of walker poets who write their verses to the rhythm of their feet. The Redas, the Rubos. Cyclist poets are less numerous, it seems, but that's an oversight since the bike is a good place to work for a writer. First, he can sit down, then he's surrounded by windy silence, which airs out the brain and is favourable to meditation. Finally, he produces with his legs a fair number of different rhythms, which are music to verse and prose. Peaceful ramble days are perfect for text brewing. I leave with a sentence, an idea, and I spin it around for a few hours. I've come home with a story almost finished, an article, the end of a piece. When I write this way, I can tell whether it's headwind prose or tailwind prose. On a bike, I love working with paradoxical thoughts, thoughts that appear maladapted. Thinking methodically about Proust, about Quinault, for example, or about Calder or Howard Hawks, I love experimenting with the distortions that effort causes texts and reflections to undergo, what sweat oxidises in them, what they bring to my cycling performance. To create a desire for something one needs is to engage in a labour of human happiness. To identify it and want it is to define oneself as a person. That's the secret of culture, the secret of cuisine, the secret of kindness. It's also the secret of the tiny cyclist on his bike in the vast countryside, miraculously in equilibrium on his two wheels, trying to catch his own shadow. <laughs>